Hi everyone. So today is finally here, the day when we finally actually finally get to talk about mechanics. So uh, to begin kind of our mechanics section of this course, uh, it's a little bit too thick. I'm going to decrease the size just a little bit. Let me erase this. Um, to begin our finally our discussion of mechanics. Mechanics. We want to start off with um, one of the important things whenever you're kind of dealing with any mechanics problem is we need to kind of dis, uh, decide and kind of create this kind of unified convention system that we'll use for uh, the rest of this class. So um, sign conventions is extremely sign conventions. So in this mechanic sections, we're gonna be kind of dealing with uh, pulling on uh, samples. So you'll typically see kind of this dog bone type shape. So you have a sample cut like this. This is a, called the dog bone. So, uh, one of the things that we would have done in the lab, unfortunately, that we can't do it now for this kind of online teaching system, uh, we would have, uh, or not online teaching, this remote teaching period, we would have put this uh, sample, this could be, again, uh, any type of material, so aluminum, polystyrene, it could be um, high-density polyethylene, it could be copper, it could be titanium, too expensive, we won't use that, but anyways, you get uh, kind of the picture. So this dog one sample could be any material that you deal with. And one of the key aspects in this class or in the mechanics section that you need um, basically for the rest of your life is how do you kind of deduce some of the mechanical properties and you do that a lot through stress strain curves. So we'll see that in a second. But basically you clamp these samples uh, with kind of these jaws like so. So you clamp the sample in and then you pull the sample. So from here on out through this course, like, you know, this is, uh, this is a special type of loading called uniaxial loading. We'll get, uh, we'll talk more about that in a second. So that's this loading condition. So that is a uh, uniaxial tensile test. Uh, so we're gonna kind of talk about that more in a second. So when you're pulling a sample like this, when the sample is extending, so if our length is increasing, so if we are extending, if we're putting the sample under extending, you know, I can't spell. Uh, <laughs> is that extend? Extend. If we're under tension, so when you pull like this, you're under tension. If you press down on the sample, so if our this is my sample and I press down on it and I load it like this, then I'm under. So here, this is tension. This is compression. If we're under tension, we're going to use this as positive stress and positive strain. Uh, we'll get to back to what those samples are. We're going to find that in just a second. If you're under compression, we're going to say, again, that's going to correlate to negative values of stress, negative values of strain. Uh, so uh, the other thing is, uh, in this class, we're not going to talk too much about uh, uh, basically kind of rotation, but we'll say that uh, counterclockwise, so CCW rotations are positive, and clockwise rotations are negative. Uh, we won't deal with this too much in this class, but again, if you take mechanics and materials, you'll deal a lot with that, essentially, you know, beam bending or kind of any torque. Uh, so you'll kind of use that. Uh, but again, this is going to be the notation that we use in this class. So tension, positive, compression, negative for both values of stress and values of strain. So the other thing that you always want, um, whenever you're kind of describing like a loading system, I'm going to kind of erase here in a second. So whenever you're dealing with mechanics problems, so erase, it's going to take some time. So if I have a mechanics problem, let's say I was doing that exact, so I have my sample, I'm pulling like this, pulling like this. I could also be kind of compressing here, compressing here. You could do all different types of kind of crazy loading states. But what we first want to do, this is a two-dimensional problem. I want to define my coordinate system. So uh, in this class, you know, typically, you know, you use X and Y. We've seen uh, in lecture two, HKL indices. Uh, but I'm going to use a lot of ones and twos in this uh, course. Um, you'll see why in a bit because, you know, again, it's going to help with kind of this uh, tensor definition of stress and strain, uh, but we'll come back to that in a second. But the key thing is whenever you're starting a problem, define your coordinate system somewhere so I could see uh, and make sure or, you know, it'll kind of help you keep on track for the rest of the problem. So please, please always start off with defining your coordinate system. So in the top right-hand corner, wherever you're at in your page, define your coordinate system first, then you can kind of work throughout these problems. So let's get to the kind of highlight of what we're going to talk about here. So the stress strain curve. So this stress strain curve is going to be generated. So 
we're going to get uh, actually just spend a lot of time on defining what stress and strain is um, in a second. But we're going to denote stress is going to be denoted by this sigma, and it's going to be stress is equal to force for the cross sectional area. So if I have a coordinate system like this, and I'm pulling on my uniaxial material here, uh, this area, the cross sectional area, is just going to be kind of this cr the cross section to where the force is being applied. So it'd be, uh, if this is a rectangular parallel pipette, it'd be that kind of uh, dimension, this cross-sectional area here. And the force is just the force that you're applied here. So this unit's um, newtons. We need this to be meter squared. This newtons per meter squared is equivalent to a unit of pascals, so PA. Strain, on the other hand, is denoted by this epsilon. It is essentially, once you pull this material, what is the change in the length? So... This is the initial length of my material, L0. So once I pull, what's the change in length divided by L0? So you'll notice that this has is unitless because it's meters per meter. So strain is unitless. You'll sometimes see it uh, expressed as percents. So make sure like it's either in just you know unitless or it's expressed as percents. So. That is your stress and strain in a nutshell. We're going to talk a lot more about this uh, in a bit. So when you generate a stress-strain curve, usually you'll see stress uh, on the y-axis and strain on the x-axis here. So let's draw kind of a typical example of a stress-strain curve and see why that stress-strain curve is so valuable. If there's anything I want you to take away from my course, it's how to interpret and how to kind of read a stress-strain curve and get uh, the kind of key mechanical properties you need from those examples. So this stress-strain curve typically generated by using doing one of these tensile testing um, specimens. Uh, so again, two, one, that's my coordinate system. So let me draw you an example of a stress strain curve. I want to highlight some key points. So stress and strain. So typically you'll see this linear region here. Sometimes you can see a dip, maybe an increase, and then finally a fracture here. So let's talk about each of these three um, about how you kind of want to interpret this curve. So the big thing I see is, or what, what we want to kind of break down are these three different regimes. So the first regime, excuse me, that I held down some value here. So the first regime here denoted by that kind of, so this is supposed to be a linear, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. There's kind of these two, or actually three regimes. So regime one is your elastic regime. So everything in between, you know, here and here. From here to here, this is regime two. This is your plastic regime. And then the final regime here where that X is, that is where your material fractured. So that X, X marks the fracture. Excuse my... Uh, so that is regime three. So regime three is fracture. Fracture. You get the picture here. <laughs> so again, a similar diagram is kind of shown in the uh, again in the OER and in the lecture notes. So please let me know. You know, again, if you need a link to uh, read that. So what is the distinction between elastic plastic and fracture deformation? So. Uh, if you go back, there's a really awesome YouTube video that shows um, Bragg, um, Bragg from Bragg's Law. He does a bubble raft experiment and explains very, very precisely the difference between elastic and plastic deformation. So elastic deformation is if I'm in this elastic regime, so if I pull, if I'm still applying a strain that's in this kind of elastic regime here, uh, if I'm in this region, if I pull on the material and I release it, it's going to pop back into its original dimensions. So there's not going to be a permanent change uh, kind of in the length of your material. So I could pull on this material. I could pull in this elastic regime. If I release, it's going to pop back, and it's not going to change length. Uh, you could also think of it, again, in the elastic regime, you're stretching on bonds. You're pulling bonds. You're stretching them, but you're not basically initiating or creating dislocation motion. So we talked about dislocations a lot in uh, Lecture 3 uh, in defects. Um, so remember, elastic deformation, you're just pulling on the bonds. Uh, ma uh, microscopically, you're not kind of uh, breaking any bonds. You're not initiating dislocation motion. For the plastic regime, you are actually uh, 
you are permanently deforming the material. So macroscopically, once you're in this regime here, if you pull on this and apply a stress or in a strain and the corresponding strain, uh, and you release that load, you plastically, you permanently deform the material. It's not going to pop back to its original length. So the original length is going to remain, uh, it's going to be different. It's going to be longer than it was, you know, kind of initially. So you've kind of seen this before. If you have like a wire hanger and you're kind of twisting it and kind of bending it, uh, you eventually, it doesn't pop back in, you know, uh, into its original shape. Uh, and you actually change, you could change the dimension if you pull it kind of hard enough there. So uh, plastic deformation, macroscopically, you are uh, permanently deforming the material. So it does not pop back to its original dimensions. Macroscopically or, or microscopically or really more atomistically, you are uh, pulling on the bonds now and also initiating dislocation motion. So the dislocations start to move in your material. You have dislocations always. You even have dislocations in that elastic regime. But in the plastic regime, you're starting to move those dislocations. And that's why there's a great, again, that uh, Bragg video shows those dislocations moving just like we kind of saw in class as well. So the difference between these two regimes, elastic, plastic, they both have dislocations uh, atomistically. In the elastic regime, you're pulling on bonds, but you're not initiating dislocation motion. But in the plastic regime, you're making dislocation motion. Macroscopically, in the elastic regime, the length does not change. You could release it and it pops back to place. Plastic deformation is permanent, irreversible deformation. Elastic is reversible deformation. That's kind of the key things in a nutshell. Fracture is the kind of really awesome part in your experiment uh, when something breaks, but uh, it's kind of boring. So in the fracture regime, you're now just breaking bonds in material. So you're actually creating surface too. Um, so you're breaking bonds and you're creating surfaces macros you know, atomistically and macroscopically uh, in your system. So those are kind of the big three key different regimes that we're dealing with. So in the elastic regime, uh, there's a couple kind of key parameters um, and distinctions in this curve. One of those distinctions is uh, you can see that this curve is pretty linear. It has this linear slope and this linear relationship between stress and strain. And that slope is given... Uh, or the, the value of that slope, the magnitude of that slope, is the Young's modulus. A very, very important parameter, E. E is your Young's modulus. E is Young's modulus. We're going to describe what that is in a second. But uh, So basically, in this regime, in this elastic regime, you have uh, basically your Hooke's law. Hopefully you've seen this before. So Hooke's law where stress is equal to uh, the Young's modulus times strain. Now, this is a very, very, very important equation to know, but a very dangerous equation to have. This relationship only holds in the elastic regime, and it only holds for this very, very, very specific um, loading condition. We're going to talk more uh, about kind of a more um, basically thorough and kind of systematic way to kind of write stress and relate stress and strain um, so there's going to be a lot more on this here, but again, don't fault. This is not your end-all, be-all equation for mechanics. It gets much, much more complex. We're going to represent stress as a second-order tensor and strain as a second-order tensor. We're going to explain that a lot more. So do not fall in love with Hooke's Law. It's great for interpreting stress and strain curves, but again, mechanics get a lot more complex and a lot more fun. So we'll come back to that in just a bit. So this uh, linear relationship uh, uh, basically holds for that. Uh, so the slope is your Young's modulus there. Let me, excuse me, let me change colors, fill back this in. So there's some other kind of key parameters here. So once you, the distinction when you switch from elastic to plastic, you basically lose this linearity. So your slope is linear, 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 and then it starts to become off uh, You know, it becomes no longer linear. Once you, and then that's where the dislocations start to move. So the point, the stress at which that occurs where you deviate from linearity is the sigma y. That is your yield stress. Sigma y is the yield stress. Also called your yield strength. This, this, uh, the strain value, is your strain at yield. So strain at yield. So again, nothing too kind of crazy out there. Um, Couple of notes again. You know, uh, this class is not about memorization, but when you're dealing with Young's modulus, uh, there's a couple kind of key or general parameters or general like values you should kind of know. So typically, if you're working with ceramics, so if I have I have some diffs, uh, some Young modulus values. So if I have a ceramic, I want to look at 
So E in, sorry, second. So Young's modulus, and if I have my material, uh, so I'm trying to figure out a way to kind of show this, but I'm just going to write it. So Young's modulus, I'm going to do that. So if I want to look at, if I'm working with ceramics, so ceramics, you know, like tungsten, uh, those are going to have your highest Young's modulus. So typically, they're going to be uh, values of 200 to 300 gigapascals for your Young's modulus, so for E. If I'm working with metals, typically they're going to be on the order of uh, about hundreds of gigapascals for GPA. Now, polymers, my favorite material, those in polymers, I always kind of include polymers and biomaterials uh, kind of in the same, you know, kind of uh, concept. Polymers can be uh, range from basically like, you know, 10 MPA megapascals to one gigapascal. So again, this is written in the notes uh, kind of there. So those are just kind of some values that you should kind of try to start to memorize. If you're not given a value in a problem, but you're given those materials, just estimate there. So, and of course, there's always differences, right? Steel has uh, basically Young's modulus of about 200 gigapascal. Uh, aluminum has a uh, Young's modulus of 69 gigapascal. So again, there can be some kind of variation uh, in those values. And obviously you see the huge variation of polymers. Again, that's what makes them so fun to work with. Um, but anyways, uh, those are just some values to kind of know and have offhand. In your plastic regime, we do not have kind of that Hooke's Law. We don't have this kind of uh, universe. We actually cannot describe uh, with kind of linear elastic uh, continuum theory and equations, uh, how do we relate stress and strain. Instead, uh, there's a lot of kind of empirical equations. There's a lot of scaling behavior. We're going to get a lot into kind of what's happening and what can kind of change uh, essentially the behavior in your plastic regime. But that's kind of not really what we're going to get, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And if you're more really interested, you want to kind of take a more, you know, a full mechanics course to kind of get into kind of strain hardening, strains, you know, softening, all those kind of other, you know, really interesting properties that unfortunately we don't have enough time to cover. But there's some other kind of important features that uh, are present in this plastic regime. One of which is what we call the highest, whatever the highest yield or the highest stress or the largest stress in your material, we give this value um, the name of sigma ECS. So that is your ultimate tensile strength. So ultimate, uh, I'm just going to say that. Ultimate UTS is ultimate tensile strength. So UTS. And that's given by that stress value right here. So whatever the maximum stress is, that is your ultimate tensile strength. This, uh, and that's really kind of the only feature in that kind of plastic regime as well. Um, finally, in the fracture regime, we also have sigma F, which is your strain at fracture, or stress at fracture, excuse me. This value here, the strain at fracture, is given by this, epsilon F. Now, that's your stress-strain curve uh, in a nutshell. Um, now, there's a couple of other things that you can kind of calculate, and actually we're going to go back through and talk about um, the one key thing you need to know about mechanics is that um, language matters a lot. So when we say something is strong or something is tough or something is stiff or something is ductile or something is brittle, it has very, very specific, specific terms and it correlates to kind of a lot of these properties here. But before we get into that, there's a couple other properties that we can kind of uh, basically measure uh, using the stress-strain curve. One is toughness. So toughness, and we, you know, toughness is defined um, basically as you take the integral. So if I want to figure out the toughness of my material, I'm going to take the integral from zero to the strain at fracture of my stress strain curve. So sigma one one, we'll explain this in just a bit. And I'm going to multiply this by the volume. This whole thing, I'm going to multiply the volume. That's how I calculate toughness. So basically I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to put this, my toughness, I'm going to decide is green. So I'm going to integrate this curve. I'm going to take the, the total area under this curve from zero to, uh, to the strain at failure. And I'm going to multiply by the volume. Why do I multiply by the volume? So toughness uh, is basically given it in units. We want it in units of energy. So like when you think about a bulletproof uh, vest material, so like Kevlar or you know some other bulletproof vest, you're looking at kind of impact toughness. How much energy can it absorb before the material fractures? That's what toughness is. 
how much energy does my material kind of suck in or what, how much energy is required in order to fracture and break that material? So what are my units that I'm working with here? Well, let's take a look. Epsilon unit list. Uh, strain, uh, stress. Excuse me. Uh, I did not mean to do that. I can help as well. All right, so uh, this is unitless strain. What are my units of stress? Pascals. A pascal is a newton per meter squared. Newton per meter squared times volume, which is meters cubed. What is this? That is a newton meter. A newton meter is joules. So those are the correct units of basically energy. So that's how you calculate toughness. You can also calculate another parameter called the elastic strain energy, or ESE. And that's going to be similarly the volume times here we're looking at just the strain to yield or the, yeah, the strain to yield of again our expression so here i'm just looking at and i'm going to make this in full blue actually i'm going to go purple i'm just looking at the area under this kind of triangle here so how much how much energy is stored elastically in this material so if I kind of pull, push, or, you know, what's the elastic energy stored to my material? That's just the, inner, you know, it's just the integral under that elastic regime. So that's all that is. So these are all kind of your material properties. Now I'm going to erase everything right now, and we are going to kind of talk about language uh, as we wrap up uh, essentially this uh, kind of problem. So I am going to erase everything here. Uh, will you save that? So when I say a material is, uh, if I say, so if I'm talking about strength, if I say material is strong, if I might say material is stiff, if I say material is compliant, if I say material is ductile, if I say material is brittle, if I say material is tough. These words are correlated with very, very, very specific material properties that are given that we just kind of talked about in the stress strain curve. So if I say a material, let's start with stiffness. If I say a material is stiff versus uh, a material is compliant, a compliant means is essentially the antonym of stiff. So if something is stiff or compliant, we are comparing basically the Young's modulus of the material. So if it's stiff, the Young's modulus is high. If it's compliant, the it's not stiff. The Young's modulus is low. If you, that is the only thing that we are comparing here, the Young's modulus for stiff and compliance. What about ducta? You kind of have an idea already, you know, you know, we always say copper is a ductile metal. The reason being is because you could kind of stretch it for a long length uh, before it kind of breaks. Uh, something's brittle, like a ceramic, it's going to kind of break easily. So it's not going to be as ductile. We can't stretch it uh, too long before it uh, kind of permanently breaks. So if we say something is ductile, what is the property that we're comparing here? Well, or brittle. Well, we're talking about the strain at failure, right? So brittle... The strain of failure is very, very low. If it's ductile, the strain of failure is very, very high. What if we say a material is tough? Well, then we're just going to deal with what we just kind of talked about, toughness. That integral volume times, again, zero, epsilon failure, integral into the curve. That is what we're kind of comparing here. Now, what about strength? This is where you have to be really, really, really careful. Uh, strength can sometimes mean the yield strength, or it can also mean the ultimate tensile strength. Be very, 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 very careful. So we want to be very specific. I don't like to use a term strength. I want you to specify either yield strength or almost ultimate tensile strength. The reason being, you can imagine in industry, if you're just reading kind of, you know, a paper and it says strength, and you're trying to design this for an application, well, do they mean yield strength or do they mean ultimate tensile strength? Those values can be extremely, extremely different. And if you're trying to design an application, you need to be specific and know exactly what you're talking about and be specific with your language and uh, material science. So I'm going to be really, really strict on you need to use these words properly and correctly in this class uh, and moving forward the rest, uh, you know, <laughs> for the remainder of your life as a uh, material science engineer. So make sure you use these terms uh, correctly and, you know, Think about, use language precisely when you're dealing with the mechanics. So uh, to kind of leave you, I'll kind of do one last quick little example. Um, so if I have a stress strain curve like this, and let me draw a couple. Let's do a little a couple of examples. So I'm going to do colors. So I'm going to have one like this. I want to have a blue one. 
like this. I want to have a green one that looks, excuse me, like this. And then I'm going to have another, I'm going to have one like this. So it doesn't always have to increase, it could just go like this. It could also soften. Um, there are strain softening materials, so where it goes up, and then down, and then like that. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then finally, actually I already used my red. I'm going to use this guy. So, which material is the most ductile? Well, it's going to be this guy. Largest strain of failure. What material has the largest ultimate tensile strength? This is not ultimate tensile strength. Well, it is for this particular material. But the ultimate tensile strength is just the largest stress that you see in your curve. So the ultimate, largest ultimate tensile strength is this material. What has the largest yield strength where it deviates from linearity? It's also this material. What material is most stiff? Steepest slope? It's also this red guy. It's the, that, that's the most popular one. <laughs> what, is the least, what is the most compliant material? That would be this one right here, lowest slope. And which material is the most brittle? Also this guy. So popular. Which material is the toughest? Well, without values, we can't really, you know, without numerical values, we can't answer that question. Also, since we don't know the volume here, we can't really answer that question either. So, you know, one of these can be 100 times larger than those other materials. So, again, we need to know that before we can answer that question. Um, what material do you think red is? A ceramic, a metal, or a polymer? I'd say it looks kind of ceramic-y, right? It's pretty brittle. It has a uh, really high Young's modulus. That kind of makes sense. Which material is most likely a polymer? Well, I would guess this one, right? Low, lowest stiffness, uh, really ductile. Polymers are extremely, extremely ductile. Biomaterials are also very ductile. So I'd say that's a polymer. And in between here, there might be some kind of metal behavior kind of going on here. So uh, that's the first lecture of mechanics. So next time we're going to talk about stress. We're going to break that down, talk about the tensorial nature of stress, talk about the uh, tensorial nature of strain in another video. And then we're probably going to get into a little tiny bit of... Uh, basically uh, some infinitesimal strain theory. So I know everyone's excited for that. So uh, until next time, uh, I'll see you all later. And again, stay safe. If there's any questions, you need more examples, please let me know. Um, and yeah, see you all next time.